Okay, we're going live on Facebook for my weekly Friday night live video. As usual, there's going to be a bit of empty nonsense uh, while I wait for some people to show up. Um, so eventually I figured I'll figure out a way of putting in some sort of a, you know those countdown, um, what are they called? You have these countdown cards where it's got it's got the timer on it right and you know and in the sometimes in the background you can hear stuff going on it's like oh <laughs> hey neil thank you very much good to see you thanks for thanks for being here <clears throat> so all right people are showing up let's get going then we don't have to wait too long at all excellent my name is nicholas kotar for those who don't know I am a fantasy author, an orthodox deacon, a blogger, a podcaster with a new podcast called In a Certain Kingdom, where I retell uh, famous and not so famous Slavic fairy tales. This season, it's mostly, actually, it's all Russian, but eventually in future seasons, we'll be getting into slightly non-Russian uh, fairy tales. And uh, I'm here once a week on Fridays at 5 p.m. Eastern to talk about, for the last few weeks, about how stories can help us become more resilient, more loving, more joyful, and just in general, better people in a time of difficulty. So over these past few weeks, as I personally have gone past a very large hump in my emotional and otherwise perhaps spiritual response to the pandemic, uh, I've, uh, I've realized that my telling stories to others has been helpful, not only to the others, but also to me. I don't know what it what it is exactly. I mean, I do know what it is. I've been talking about it for weeks now. But um, sometimes we storytellers tend to get into preaching mode and forget about the fact that we're telling stories not only for others, but also for ourselves. <clears throat> so uh, I'm hoping that everybody can hear me and that there aren't, it aren't any issues with sound because there have been times before when I've gone live and... <clears throat> Five minutes into the video, I get a message from people saying, um, we can't hear anything, but it looks like everything's fine. So I think we'll just move on. So recently, I've uh, I've been listening to a wonderful podcast. Um, not my own, although I do listen to that one a lot, perhaps more than I should. <laughs> well, it's for technical reasons. I have to make sure that I'm not saying stupid things, um, which I do occasionally. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Sound is clear. Excellent. All right. Uh, I've been listening to a wonderful new podcast that I'm happy to recommend to you all. It's called uh, Deep Questions, and it's run by Cal Newport, who was one of my heroes. He's one of my favorite people in the world. Um, he is the guy who wrote the books um, Deep Work and Digital Minimalism, two of my favorite nonfiction books written in the last 10 years or so. And it turns out the guy is not just a fantastic writer, but he is a really interesting, deep thinker and somebody who is engaging with life on a profound level. Something very lovely to see in a time when everybody is just uh, rage commenting at each other on Twitter. I mean, I don't know if you've seen some of the stuff that's been going on today ever since the announcement of President Trump getting COVID. It's, it's brutal out there. Luckily, the kinds of people that do post that kinds of thing are actually a, not a very large percentage of the population. Um, there are some studies to, to at least suggest that the kinds of people that actually go out and comment um, are, lar are a very small subset of people who actually use social media. That being said, the, n the number of people that we are seeing doing this sort of thing is rather scary. So to find people like Cal Newport who are on top of things and who, like me, find uh, answers to difficult questions in literature and in ancient philo philosophical traditions and in deep contemplation, there's, there's, they're out there. Um, and it's, it was really nice to see. So Cal Newport... In this wonderful new um, podcast of his, uh, Bev says that uh, there's a reason why she's not on Twitter. Yes, Bev, I hear you. <laughs> I've basically gotten rid of Twitter and I only use it uh, to share my uh, content, um, but I never spend any time on it. So what Cal's been talking about a lot recently, and he talks about uh, at least one third of his podcast, uh, talk, uh, talk about the idea of a deep life. And he came to this idea of a deep life by um by first considering something that he's called the uh, or no he's been talking about the deep life for a while but recently as we're starting to claw ourselves out of out of the situation that has caught us unawares on so many levels he's been talking about how once the initial panic 
goes away for a lot of people, they start looking at this situation, and certainly I've count myself among these people, as an opportunity to kind of have a reset on many aspects of life and many aspects of our work and personal relationships and professional and personal life. He's calling it the deep reset. And he talks about it specifically in in these terms, which I found really compelling. He brought the example of, of, the, uh, of the Odyssey, where in some versions of the myth, not in the one by Homer, but in other versions of the myth, after coming back home and fixing his house, uh, Odysseus goes on and continues by taking an oar out into the depths of the mainland of Greece and then offering it as a, as a uh, sacrifice to Poseidon. Now he uses, Calvin Newport uses this, uh, th this myth to underline a, an idea that I think all of us can agree with, an idea that I've been talking about not quite so clearly as Cal, uh, in the following way. He says, hardship unlocks a deep, more authentic, more satisfying way of living. Or it can, if you allow it. This is the best response to unexpected difficulties. He goes on then, and I totally agree with him. And then he goes on to go to goes even deeper. He talks about how there are actually two stages to dealing with the hardship associated with unexpected difficulties, not just one. And I, some people have been have been comparing the responses to COVID uh, to the stages of grief. I think that's an interesting idea. But it's not as compelling to me as this two-prong approach that Cal Newport is offering by suggesting that the first step to dealing with it is simply survival and progress. That's Odysseus battling through all of the troubles that he goes through in the Odyssey. Then, following the survival, after you've gotten to a point when, you're, when, you, when you are no longer reacting constantly to dangerous stimuli, then comes a moment where with a mix of humility and driven purpose, you then commit to transforming your life into something deeper. That something deeper is what Cal Newport calls a deep life. I like that phrase. I'm going to be using it. The deep life. Where you stop focusing on things that are on the surface, the shallows, and instead put your energy into the lasting things that will affect you, that will affect your community, your family, and your relationship with the divine, however that relationship might manifest in your own life. Now, for him, for Cal Newport, the, uh, the story that brought all this together was the story of Odysseus. For years now, I've thought about someone else and a different story as a perfect example of this kind of response to hardship, and that's Aragorn. Uh, I actually gave a lecture on Aragorn as, an, as a kind of heroic ideal a few years ago at a, at a lecture to a bunch of uh, 17 and 18 year olds and it was received pretty well and I, and I uh, rediscovered my old notes from it this week and I thought there's something here that is valuable I think not only for myself but for others so I'd like to share it with you. So um, Aragorn is a fantastic storytelling example of how to deal with difficulties Here's and I'll explain why. This information that I'm going to be sharing with you is actually not in the Lord of the Rings, it's in the appendix. In a wonderful section of the of appendix A, which is called The Tale of Aragorn and Arwen. If you guys have not read this, you are missing out. It is a wonderful addition to the main storyline of the Lord of the Rings and it brings out certain aspects of Aragorn and uh, Arwen's relationship that are only hinted at in the main body of the text of the Lord of the Rings. But if you understand what's actually going on it, and then come back to the Lord of the Rings with that knowledge, it makes Aragorn's story so much more compelling. Precisely because we don't ever see through Aragorn's point of view. There's a reason we don't. Aragorn is an ideal. He's not somebody who's being made. He's already somebody who has been made. So as an ideal, he's not somebody through whose eyes we can see because we cannot understand his thought process. We are still in Hobbit stage. We're still in the stage of being formed. Th these are things that we've been talking about a lot with my book club. We just finished reading The Lord of the Rings together. So those of you who, who have been there, um, you know, and who are like, stop talking about the same thing over and over again. <laughs> I'm sorry, but these are things that um, I find to be compelling and interesting. So let's talk about Aragorn's life and how he's such an excellent um, model for us these days. <clears throat> His father was killed in what effectively was a war zone. When Aragorn was two, he never knew his father. And that immediately is a point of reference for so much of what we're going through now. So many of our young men go through life, if not without fathers, which is which happens a lot, 
or at least with absent fathers for various reasons. This is a real epidemic. It's a real problem of today. So already we see a point of reference that where Tolkien has plugged into something that is very relevant and very interesting. His mother was probably um, a teenager when this happened. Not, you know, 12, 13, but like 17, 18. She was very, very young. So the, the shock... And the trauma of losing a husband, but also when your child is very small, must have been significant. And then she was taken uh, to live in Rivendell with Elrond. Now, we shouldn't think that just because she's outside of the war zone, she's necessarily having a pleasant or happy life. Aragorn's mother was a tragic figure who was never able to get past the trauma and very soon ended up dying quite young. He was called Estelle. Aragorn was called Estelle, which, is, which means hope. And from his youth... Even though he didn't know who he was, he was basically raised in an atmosphere of guerrilla warfare. And he made his name, even as a teenager, by going out onto uh, military raids with the sons of Elrond. Then at age 20, Aragorn calls him to himself and tells him who he is. A really fascinating choice on uh, Elrond's part. So he didn't grow up with any sense of significance, with any sense of doom, with any sense of purpose. Not necessarily, right? He didn't know who he was. Who he actually was, was the heir to the kingdom of Westerness. The heir to Numenor, the heir to the kings who at one point actually lived within eyeshot, so to speak, of the Blessed Realm. Uh, which is a story that is uh, recounted in the Acalabeth and the Silmarillion, in the volume that includes the Silmarillion, and is the basis, that whole story is the basis, we hope, for the forthcoming Lord of the Rings uh, Amazon Prime series, which I still hold out high hopes for. He was brought then, Aragorn was brought before Elrod, who then gave him the heirlooms of his kingdom, the Ring of Barahir and the Shards of Narsil, the sword that uh, belonged to Isildur and that chopped off the finger that held the ring uh, right off of Sauron's hand. Except Elrond, when he's talking to him, doesn't give him all of the gifts of his kingship. Elrond goes on to say, the scepter of Anuminus, the scepter of kingship, I withhold, for you have yet to earn it. Really, really interesting scene. Because here, Elrond is given this sudden purpose, after already having been raised in a time of warfare. But he's not given his full gift yet. Because at this point, he has not fully understood and has not fully embraced the reality of the difficulty that has been given to him, whether he likes it or not. And that difficulty is constant, unremitting, warfare against Sauron and against the, his minions. Sauron isn't around, but his forces are out there. His orcs are out there. And so he becomes a kind of uh, a figure, a very fascinating figure, who, when faced with the difficulty of this inheritance, because the inheritance means he has a kingdom that doesn't exist and, and has to restore it while having no army, while having no love lost from his fellow Gondorians who don't particularly like the kingdom in the north. It's not fair. He's been given this gift, which is a kingship with no throne and a life that is going to be filled with hardship of traveling constantly, of being constantly in danger, of being in constant threat of impending death. I keep harping on this because I think it's important that we remember that these stories are speaking to actual realities that we have to go through. I think this is a, it should be a clear parallel. Here comes the virus, a hidden secret enemy that is constantly impending uh, doom and gloom and death. And our response has not been the response of Aragorn. And Aragorn's response is very, very telling. I'm going to read a wonderful section where uh, that describes the, um, the response of Aragorn to his unexpected difficulties. Aragorn took leave lovingly of Elrond, who was effectively his father. And the next day he said farewell to his mother and to the house of Elrond and to Arwen, whom he had just met and fallen in love with. And he went out into the wild. For nearly thirty years he labored in the cause against Sauron. He became a friend of Gandalf the Wise, from whom he gained much wisdom. With him he made many perilous journeys, but as the years wore on he went more often alone. His ways were hard and long, and he became somewhat grim to look upon, unless he chanced to smile. And yet he seemed to men worthy of honor, as a king that is in exile, 
when he did not hide his true shape, for he went in many guises and won renown under many different names. He rode in the host of the Rohirrim and fought for the Lord of the Gondor, who was his servant, I should have you know, by the way, by land and by sea. And then in the hour of victory, he passed out of the knowledge of men of the West and went alone far into the East and deep into the South, the lands of the enemy, exploring the hearts of men, both evil and good, and uncovering the plots and devices of the servants of Sauron. Thus he became at last the most hardy of living men, skilled in their crafts and lore, and yet, and was yet more than they, for he was elven wise, and there was a light in his eyes that when they were kindled, few could endure. His face was sad and stern because of the doom that was laid on him, and yet hope ever dwelt deep in the depths of his heart, Hope dwelt ever in the depths of his heart, from which mirth would arise at times, like spring from the rock. Okay, so this is really a wonderful, wonderful passage. And I want to bring attention to a few things that uh, constitute a kind of list of concrete actions that he took as a reaction to sudden and unexpected hardship. He starts out by finding a vetted mentor. Uh, Gandalf the Wise is a very vetted mentor because Gandalf is effectively a kind of incarnate angel. You can't get more vetted than that. But following that, he then goes on to travel alone. He embraces solitude, becoming grim to look at except when he smiled. So there's the importance of solitude here, but also the importance of holding your joy deep within and, and only letting it out at certain times. This is a very Russian thing, by the way. Russians often <laughs> Russians often criticize Americans for having their smile constantly on their face and not having any corresponding depths on the inside. I don't think that's a true <laughs> I, I don't subscribe to this idea. I don't think it's it's a it's a properly um, thought out criticism. But it's certainly the opposite way of the way Russians do things. Russians tend to to be face forward with their grimness. They're like Aragorn in a lot of ways. And once they let you into their home and uh, allow you to sit at table with them, uh, that is when they smile. And the smile of a Russian is it can be a very warm thing, um, as, of course, the smile of an American can be as well. Uh, and the next thing he did, the third thing, was that he hid his name. He didn't go trumpeting about that he's the king of, of Arnor and Gondor combined. And he sought renown under different names. He had, as it were, pen names. <laughs> he went alone then to, to explore the hearts of men, to come and to come to know the depths of man's existence in the deep dark places of the people he didn't know the west sorry the east and the south the grim men of harad and other countries that tended to worship sauron and go to war for him kind of a spy for the west and yet he was made sure to look for both the good and the evil there how not by looking at the external appearances but by delving deep into the hearts of the ones he encountered. You've been hearing me talk about the importance of relating one-on-one -on -one with people of different skin colors, ideologies, ways of looking at the world. Aragorn did this in a very clear and a very interesting way. Then he followed that with becoming very skilled in two things, in the crafts of hand, doing things with your hands, the kind, the kind of art of manliness kind of stuff, but also becoming skilled in lore, in the lore of men, but also in the lore of elves. And in this, uh, in the world of Lord of the Rings, the lore of, the lore of elves is effectively angelic lore because the elves are the first children of Iluvatar. They are the ones that were the most, the closest to the Valar. They are the ones that take the traditions of the Blessed Realm into the fallen land of the West. So that's important as well. Then, after that, he accepts that there is a doom laid on him. He acknowledges it, he accepts it, and then he moves forward. But there, then a very interesting thing happens, and this is the next stage in his life. This is after he comes back home after his 30 years of wandering and sees Arwen again, at which point he renews his vow of love to her, and at this point Arwen says that she chooses him over the life of the elves. She chooses to become a mortal because of her love for him. This is a really interesting moment. Because at that point, he does the proper thing and goes to Elrond to tell of Arwen's choice. When Elrond learned of the choice of his daughter, he was silent, though his heart was grieved, and found the doom long feared, none the easier to endure. And when Aragorn came again to Rivendell, he called to him and he said, 
My son, years come when hope will fade, and beyond them little is clear to me. And now a shadow lies between us, maybe it has been appointed so, that by my loss the kingship of men may be restored. Therefore, though I love you, I say to you, Arwen Undomiel shall not diminish her life's grace for less cause. I say to you, she shall not be the bride of any man less than the king of both Gondor and Arnor, of both sundered kingdoms. To me, then, even our victory can bring only sorrow and parting, but to you hope of joy for a while. Alas, my son, I fear that to Arwen the doom of men may seem hard at the ending. So it stood afterwards between er Elrond and Aragorn, and they spoke no more of this matter. But Aragorn went forth again to danger and toil, and while the world darkened and fear fell in Middle-earth, as the power of Sauron grew, Arwen remained in Rivendell, and when Aragorn was abroad, from afar she watched over him in thought, and in hope she made for him a great and kingly standard, such as only one such as only one might display who claimed the lordship of the Numenorians, and the inheritance of Elendil. And this doom, I want to go back and talk about the doom that was imposed on him. If I if I can find this spot, it's a wonderful, wonderful spot. One day, therefore, before the fall of the year, he called Aragorn to his chamber, and he said, Aragorn, lord of the Dunedain, listen to me, a great doom awaits you, either to rise above the height of all your fathers since the days of Elendil, or to fall into darkness with all that is left of your kin. Many years of trial lie before you, you shall neither have wife nor bind any woman to you until your time comes, and you are found worthy of it. So this is, this point, after he has done 30 years of trial and hardship, the next phase comes. At that point, he can extend he can go out from his internal and external solitude and he is now ready to go and then extend his knowledge and his ability and his love outwards to his community to his direct family to arwen he is now uh, worthy to go and tell her i love you and to hear the response from her i will be your wife this is wonderful because it charts for us the the proper order of the response that we should be taking to the difficulties placed in our way. And it shows us that the initial response, which was survive and become better, isn't enough. Because at this point, Aragorn has to make a second choice, to go back out into the wild. But for what purpose? Not for the purpose of simply progressing and becoming better himself, but for the purpose of accepting his doom. The doom of men. This is not only Aragorn's doom. Because I think if we extend it to ourselves, this is the doom that we all have of being people living in a world that does not make the achievement of our purpose very easy. And yet, only through the achievement of that purpose, and the purpose is found in living a deep life, which I'll talk about later, only in the fulfillment of that purpose is there any possibility of achieving the quest, the quest which is the assumption of the doom and then the extension of the doom out into everyday life, into making one's life, Aragorn's life, a kind of incarnation of those principles that he applied during the 30 years of his testing. So then he utterly rejects the shadow. He has a moment where he utterly rejects and it becomes the enemy of it forever. And he has a quest. And the quest is, by any means necessary, become the king of Gondor and Arnor. Interestingly enough, and I'm going to do a, a bit of an aside now, uh, I'm going to come back to, to these principles that Aragorn has for us, and I'm going to discuss them in more detail, how they actually refer to everyday life for us now in this moment. But before I do that, I want to talk about movie Aragorn. <laughs> uh, if there are any of you here who, have, who are members of my book club, you will know that... Um, Movie Aragorn and movie Faramir make me mad. I'm going to try not to have to rant over here, but they do make me mad. And for many reasons, but for one reason in particular, especially if you talk about the Aragorn of the tale of Aragorn and Arwen and compare him to movie Aragorn. Because he, in, in the movie, is a man chewed through with doubt. He is a man who has not passed through 30 years of testing in the wild. When he looks at the shards of Narsil in Rivendell, remember that scene where, where Arwen comes up to him in the back and says, you will be okay. And he goes, I can't do this. I will never be able to do this. Oh my gosh. I'm, how can I be king? La, 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 blah, blah. Why, 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 and complain, complain. Doubt creeps in at the very possibility of him making the same choices as Isildur. Oh no. When faced, when put to the question at the very last moment, 
Will I be able to say no to the ring? My ancestor said he was not able to say no. Am I fated to repeat the mistakes of my ancestors? Woe is me. Again, blah, 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 wine, wine, wine. And then when Legolas rather annoyingly then uh, declares him to be king at the Council of Elrond in the movie, remember? When Boromir says, who is this ranger from the north or something like that? Legolas gets up. He's mad. He goes, this is the king of Gondor. You owe him your allegiance. How does Aragorn respond to this rather bizarre and completely unfounded uh, outburst by Legolas? Because Legolas probably doesn't even know that Aragorn is who he is. Not, not many people do. What is Aragorn's reaction? He's super annoyed. He's like, oh, come on, Legolas, don't. I don't want to talk about it, please. I, don't mention the king thing. I am so conflicted. Uh, and then Boromir, ugh, Boromir, he says that really, really stupid phrase. Gondor has no king. Gondor needs no king. Of course, that doesn't happen in the book at all. I mean, Boromir has his doubts, but he is very respectful of Aragorn. Aragorn towers over the figure of, of, of Boromir at the Council of Elrond. Aragorn is way more impressive than Boromir is. Boromir, of course, is the preferred hero for the Peter Jacksons of this world, for the, for the people who prefer a less heroic, a less traditional view of the hero. Heroic view of the hero. Gosh, look at me being very eloquent. You know what I mean about the modern tortured hero, the, the self-reliant one who makes his own fate, who's very susceptible to evil because, of course, that makes him more relatable, who would never say things like, I utterly reject the shadow, like Faramir does in the book. Not that he does in the movie, but we're not going to go into Faramir because I'll be here for an hour and a half. And of course, the tragic beauty of Boromir's death, which happens, you know, very much in the camera, in the book, in the movie, sorry, but doesn't happen in the book, right? There is, we don't have that extremely affecting, extremely beautiful, I'll grant you, extremely beautiful moment of, of Boromir continuing to, attack the, the orcs as he's being shot that was that was gorgeous except it still misses the point that aragorn is the king not boromir aragorn he doesn't have these these self-loathing bits that are so popular in modern heroic characters no 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 aragorn in my weakness is my strength that's aragorn since it seemed fit that Isildur's heir should repair to should labor to repair Isildur's fault, I went with Gandalf on the long and hopeless search for Gollum. That's the real Aragorn. And of course, the sword is reforged before they leave, not in movie number three, as it is in Peter Jackson's version. And that's so important because he has already shown himself to be worthy. And when he's going out with the fellowship, that is the capstone of his final quest. He's done all the work already. He doesn't need to be tested. Of course, for the purposes of the movie, it makes it more dramatic when Elrond comes and gives his sort of final okay. It kind of brings into the action of Lord of the Rings the stuff that goes on in the tale of Aragorn and Arwen. And I understand why they did it in the movie. It might have been necessary in order to provide the necessary stakes and the necessary um, tension. But it makes Aragorn a much weaker figure. It's not the kind of Aragorn who we can look at as a heroic figure. And that's my point, right? That's what I've been talking about these last few weeks. We have to be careful about the kinds of stories that we look at and that we read. And this is why reading books and reading stories on paper is usually so much better for us. Because the heroes that we encounter in good literature, the heroes that we encounter in fairy tales, they are not subject to the realities of 90 minutes or 120 minutes of screen time. They can be truly heroic. And we can encounter them in a way that is much more visceral and much more effective to us, effective and affective to us. There's some comments here. I want to make sure I'm not missing anything special. Moses, another zinger, says, Our whole modern reality is based on hiding and running from the doom of men. Each one of us has a part in the burden of doom to carry. Yeah, I totally agree with that statement, Moses. Another zinger. <laughs> so in conclusion, um, I don't want to go too, too far too long with this. Here are seven lessons. Uh, are they seven? Yes, they are. Lessons from Aragorn that we can use in our everyday life to transform this moment of hardship, this moment of difficulty, this moment of COVID into a more satisfying, resilient, and yes, joyful life. There are two phases to it. There's a testing phase. Like Aragorn, we should do everything we can to find a mentor, but it's not enough to find a mentor. We're seeing this, right? Those people that, that choose to make MSNBC, uh, Fox News, 
New York Times as their mentors in how to how to deal with the information overflow around COVID are finding themselves pushed pushed and there is a moment of hardship just outside of my door. My daughter is wailing. Give me one moment. <clears throat> my own Arwen has taken care of the situation. So I can go and carry on talking about Aragorn. Um, hooray for Arwen, by the way. So finding a mentor. It's very important that we find the right one. If you're paying any attention to the way that the media is covering this, they are going with the most salacious story. Go back and look at the headlines from March. You will not believe the kind of things that the news was telling us that it is now saying the exact opposite of right now. I'm not going to get into the details if you're paying attention. You know this to be true already. So you need to find the right one. If you can find an incarnate angel, I wish. <laughs> that would be best. But... The search for the mentor is really important, and you got to make double sure that the mentor is a good mentor. That's number one. Number two, seek solitude after you found your mentor. Super important. We live in a really shallow society, and our smartphones are making us dumber. A point very beautifully made by Cal Newport in his book, uh, Digital Minimalism and Deep Work, and continually made in his wonderful podcast, Deep Questions. I, I recommend that you all read into this a little bit especially social media usage is making us really not okay you're seeing this and again i mentioned already the response to, to trump's being sick only in solitude can we allow our brain the necessary and our heart the necessary space to actually make the connections that will help us to make the insights to have the insights that will help us our own personal selves deal with the questions that face us both in the small world of our immediate family and circumstances, and also the large world of COVID, etc. Because in that solitude, you have contemplation, and from that solitude and contemplation, only then can come joy. The third thing we should do is try out different ideas, but not by dealing with them superficially. We should go into the enemy's camp. We should look at ideas, we should encounter ideas that we don't agree with. We should look deep into the heart of those ideas, like Aragorn looked into the heart of the Haradrim, the Easterlings, and the Southrons. We should test them out, but in the testing out of the ideas that we don't agree with, the ideas that we consider to be uh, an antithetical to our own, never forget or lose sight of the teachings of our mentor, because that's what Aragorn did. Aragorn became a spy for the good, but always he made sure to come back and test his ideas, test his conclusions by talking to Gandalf. The fourth thing we should do now is find a craft, is to become good with our hands, is to take opportunities to fix things when they break instead of throwing them out and buying new ones. I mean, I, I, from my own personal experience, I can't tell you how rewarding it has been to do things like fix a broken vacuum cleaner. And it turns out it's not so hard. <laughs> or to make a planter box. Like you can go online and buy a, buy a planter box that has you know all the stuff ready and just screw stuff in it's it's nowhere near as, as rewarding as building the planter box by going and buying lumber and then actually using a saw to cut it into the pieces the size pieces that you need incredibly rewarding but it's not enough to do just the craft to become good at it you should also seek to to become rich in lore <laughs> as aragorn became that means expand our minds Read books that are difficult to read. Sit and read for long, long form for long periods of time. Read philosophy. Read theology. Read the classics. Read Tolkien. Read Dostoevsky. Read Dickens. Read George Eliot. Be with those masters of lore. Let them change your heart. Because that is the best way to start becoming more compassionate and empathetic to the suffering of others. Because the next stage is to accept your doom. I'm not sure how many of us have come to accept the doom that is post-COVID reality. Because the world's not going to be the same. It's not possible. Somebody made a really interesting point recently. These kinds of viruses have been happening for about the past 10 or 15 years in, uh, in Asia. right? You've had swine flu, swine flu and bird flu. 
as a result of those outbreaks that were primarily contained in the East, there is, is a completely different culture when it comes to personal hygiene and when it comes to socializing in public. I'm sure you've noticed that even before COVID, very often you will see Asians flying with masks on. I've noticed it all over the world, whenever, I, whenever, whenever I'm in Russia especially, because you have a lot of traffic coming from China. It's very common for people from there to be willingly wearing masks when they travel. This is unfortunately probably going to be the extended reality of what we see around us. Whether or not we want to participate in it is an entirely different question. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that there is going to be a, ch a shift because this is our generation's big catastrophe. This is our, I hope, our generation's World War II. God, please, no World War III in my generation. This is enough. And that being the case, nothing could be the same afterwards. So accepting that doom is important before we can go on to the next step, step number six, which is the transition from the testing phase to the action phase. Because as soon as we've accepted our doom, and we have to accept it before we can do this, only then can we then extend our heart outwards to those who are around us. That means reforge the proper relationships with our wives, our parents, our children, our brothers, our sisters, and those who are in our immediate proximity. That's a really difficult and important thing to do, especially when those who we love are not on the same page as we are, are not yet on the same stage of the quest as we are. That happens a lot now. Not all of us are ready yet to accept the doom and the quest that follows it. So that's the necessary step. Before we go on the quest, we have to reforge and fix the relationships around us and make sure that we are doing everything we can to be loving, to be compassionate, to be accepting, and to extend our heart outwards, if only to sit and listen to other people as they are suffering. And that follows with step number seven, number seven, which is the quest. With a mix of humility and purpose, then we can transform our lives into something deeper by then living a deep life. Unfortunately, we can't go out into the wild and fight the servants of Sauron. I think that would have been would be easier if we had Aragorn's choice to go gird up our loins, become you know head of the Dunedain, and go out and become a ranger in the wild. Honestly, I think that would be easier. Our our quest is internal. Our quest is in, involves living the deep life what that is and how we can get to it is something i'm going to be exploring for the next seven weeks and so i invite all of you to come and join me and to tell your friends about a new series that i'm going to be sharing with you by email i haven't come up with the pithy name for it but it's going to be a series a seven week series for readers writers and culture creators on how best to use storytelling to deal with this present reality. I'm going to be sharing information that from my own research. I'm going to be sharing archetypes from stories. I'm going to be sharing scientific research. I'm going to be sharing anecdotes. And I'm going to be collecting all of this information into a an email series that you're not going to want to miss. It's totally free. You don't have to do anything except sign up for my email list at nicholaskotar.com. Uh, as soon as you show up there, there'll be a little pop-up in the corner that allows you to sign up for my mailing list, at which point you will immediately uh, be sent a link to download two of my books for free. So that's an additional incentive for you all. But I'm going to be going through the seven steps that Aragorn helps us. And I'm going to be going through each of them every week in detail. So if you like what I said today, if you like the idea of using the stories that we read, the legends that we encounter, the stories that we see and hear and tell ourselves in order to live a more satisfying, joyful, and fulfilling life, then let's do it together because I'm going to be exploring all this and I want to share it with somebody and not just, uh, you know, share it into an empty room. So come and join. Um, there's already a bunch of people that have signed up. I'm going to be making a graphic available on Facebook and on other social media that's shareable and that makes it very clear um, just by the image. So if you see it, grab it, like it, and share it, and let people know, whether in person or uh, through um, email, that this is happening. I think it's going to be a lot of fun, and I invite you to come and join me. So that's a seven-week series. It's going to be starting next Monday. Uh, so be, be sure to sign up before that happens to get your first email, which is going to be talking about the finding of a mentor. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, it's uh, it's an interesting time we live in, obviously, and uh, I've been encouraged 
by how many of you have reached out to me and told me and have been telling me that the stories that I've been sharing on my podcast and in other places have been inspiring. I really appreciate you telling me that. And uh, it's not just useful for me to hear, but it's also encouraging because sometimes, you know, in the um, in the wilds where I live, uh, you know, you encounter the same people every single day and you don't always know whether the things you do out in the in the wilderness of the Internet are actually useful. So um, I appreciate all of the positive comments that you all have been sending my way. Uh, it's been very encouraging. But in the meantime, I encourage you to go and look at uh, Cal Newport's um, podcast, Deep Questions, and check out his blog. He has a series on the Deep Reset, is what he calls it. So if you put in Cal Newport Deep Reset, it'll take you immediately to his page. Uh, it's some really interesting uh, blog posts about the deep life and what he considers the most important pillars of the deep life to be. I'm not going to go exactly uh, by his um, uh, according to his system. Um, we're going to be mining the stories to come up with our own system, and hopefully that'll be a useful and interesting one for you all. In the meantime, it's uh, almost 6 p.m. of a Friday. Um, although there is no more distress happening over there, it's time for Aragorn, for this Aragorn to go and make sure that Arwen is uh, not toiling in the kitchen too much. <laughs> um, so I'm going to say good night. I hope you have a wonderful Friday evening with your loved ones uh, or with yourself and a book and uh, something nice to drink, if that's what it is. And I will see you all again um, next week uh, on Friday at 5 p.m. to continue my online uh, live video series. And again, that this is just a reminder for you that if you want to be part of my seven-week series exploring storytelling um, techniques uh, to live a more satisfying and resilient life, um, come and join me at nicholaskotar.com and sign up for my email list. Um, I, I hope it's going to be uh, useful and exciting for you. Anyway, um, good night to you all, and uh, yeah, I'll see you all when I see you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.